Good morning. I'll now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It's Tuesday, August 9th, 9 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Koenig? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. Now, I understand we're having some technical difficulties this morning with our agenda management software. Uh, Clerk, could you please uh, let the audience know uh, how to participate and make comments? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, due to ongoing technical difficulties that we're experiencing with our agenda management system, users will be unable to view today's meeting through the IQM2 platform link as it's currently not functioning. Anyone wishing to watch today's meeting can do so by viewing the live stream on the County of Santa Cruz's Facebook page or online via the community television broadcast at communitytv.org forward slash watch forward slash CTV dash government dash education dash 2672 forward slash. Additionally, the public can join and participate in today's meeting via Zoom. The Zoom call-in number is 1-669-900-6833. And the webinar ID is 851-6321-0200. Again, that number is 1-669-900-6833. And webinar ID 851-6321. 0200. Additionally, the Zoom link to join online by web is https colon forward slash forward slash us 06 web dot zoom dot us forward slash j forward slash 851 Our apologies for any inconvenience this may cause, and we appreciate your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk. I'll have a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance. Is there anyone on the board that wants to dedicate this moment of silence to anyone? Yes, <clears throat> Mr. Right. Chair, I wanted to uh, ask people to keep in mind the Mackey family, uh, Russ Mackey, who was a longtime Bonnie Dooner, very active in fire issues and just generally an advocate for his community, uh, passed, his, what, passed away and we wanna keep him and his family in our hearts. Thank you. We'll keep Mr. Mackey in our hearts. Moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To item three, CAO Palacios, are there any additions or deletions to the regular agenda today? Yes, we do have a uh, a few corrections on the consent agenda. Item 30, attachment A, page 355, was replaced to add section 1.1.1, terms of the contract. And then on item 34, on the consent agenda, the formal title should read, approve the consultant contract in the amount of $283,747 to develop the Santa Cruz Regional Vehicles, Vehicle Miles Traveled Mitigation Program adopt a resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of 448,000 and take related actions as recommended by the deputy CAO, director of community development and infrastructure. That concludes the corrections to the agenda. Thank you. Move to item four. Does any board member wish to remove items from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll proceed with public comment. Uh, 
anyone wish to make a comment, please approach the podium. We'll accept your comments for two, min two minutes uh, per speaker. And you may address your comments to any item on the today's consent or regular agenda or yet to be heard uh, on the agenda or addressed by this board. The board will not respond immediately to any comments we hear today, but may follow up with you uh, via email or phone call. So please begin. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Nikki Yates. I am the president of the Mid Managers Association. I, as you notice, all the mid managers behind me are standing in support. The message that our members want to convey to you is that they feel unhappy, unappreciated, and undervalued. A recent survey conducted by MMA found that 55% of our respondents are actively looking for work elsewhere, solely due to feeling unappreciated and undervalued. I don't need to spell out for the board how disastrous it would be to lose approximately 60 mid-managers. The members are very unhappy with the following items. A 3% 3% per year for cost of living is not acceptable in today's economy, and it only continues to negatively impact the salary compensation for mid-managers. Members who have reached their vacation cap due to furloughs and impacted schedules are losing those hours and not being able to have them paid out. The county negotiation team continually denying our request to bring health care contribution in line with terms already agreed to with SEIU. The hours of uncompensated overtime worked by our members in calendar year 20 and 21 equal over 24,000 hours. This is the equivalent of 11.6 years extra work. That's a staggering number. The value of the county proposal for retro pay is about 12 cents on the dollar. Being told by the county that our uncompensated overtime is a lifestyle choice. The fact that the county had the mechanism to reimburse managers and get reimbursed themselves with FEMA funds but chose not to do this is simply demoralizing. No offer of hero pay or bonuses, even though SCIU members got that. Uh, MIM managers made less than their staff during the public health emergencies. In conclusion, in the past, the past two years have taken a, a huge toll on morale. We ask that the keep going. Okay, sorry. We ask that the latest proposal by MMA be seriously considered by the county and showed mid managers the respect and compensation they deserve, in recognition for their contributions to our community. I urge you to read all the letters that have been sent in by our members in the past few days. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I don't think I've ever gotten applause before I spoke. I couldn't help myself. Good morning. I hope you guys all enjoyed your vacation. Glad to be here. I'm, I must have missed something. I'm always missing things. So uh, I don't know what kind of media people are really looking at in Santa Cruz County, California, or the United States or the world. But um, I'm very happy that you guys over four days approved your $1.3 million budget. Uh, I don't, I just don't know what's secure anymore. Um, once again, I wasn't, ex I'm, I got here late. So uh, there's a lot of things that seem to be going on around the world that are almost never brought up in this room. And uh, I hope that it's great to see three of the five of you and everybody else in the room. Um, I'm glad I didn't have to wear a mask or put on something because I just forgot it. So, uh, hey, I've been on vacation too, but I'm getting my vacations right now are paid vacations. So uh, I like that. Um, I don't know really where to begin or where to end. I was really, oh, there's at least one other community member that's here constantly. So, Nice to see all you guys. I hope to see the two missing members. Um, Ryan Coonerty hasn't been here once since this was opened up for public comments, and Zach Friend has at least been here once. So uh, you guys know what I say. It's all recorded. Nice to see you guys. Thank you, Mr. Whitman.
Good morning. Welcome back. <laughs> Hope you had a nice break. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos. I'm disappointed, Chair Koenig, that you would not pull item number 14 for um, public comment off of it, for better public comment off the agenda, uh, consent agenda. This has to do with your board's responses to the excellent grand jury reports that have come out. Um, I really think that it would behoove your board to set it as an agenda item for public discussion and staff reports. It's buried <laughs> as item 14 in the consent agenda. There are two excellent reports in there, I think, especially the use of Measure S library funds to build a community center. The responses that the board I don't think you wrote them, <laughs> that were given on your behalf are vague and unacceptable. The responses for the misuse and deception of Measure G, the half cent countywide sales tax, that voters were led to believe would fund fire and have not funded fire at all, was deceptive. And the grand jury spelled this out. The responses are vague and unacceptable and will not lead to an increase in public trust. What I ask you to do is to come back to this issue and to discuss it publicly and to assure the voters, what are you going to do to improve this? What are you going to do? And that's the subject of the third excellent grand jury report. I'd like to move on now to uh, item 15, the ongoing disaster of the fuel tank with county fire. And now CSA 48 voters are going to have to pay for that. And the work still hasn't been being done. Ms. Steinbrenner. May I just say one? Please complete your comments. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have concerns about item number 49 and 34. Uh, Countywide mitigations for developers, traffic impact fees will not work. It needs to be done in the area where this project is. That's 34. And 49, the emergency, um, uh, 41, the emergency routes are not going to be repaired this year. Uh, that worries me a lot. Thank you very much. Oh, and, and it was a real hard time for the public because the website's meeting calendar did not work at all yesterday. It didn't work until almost eight o'clock last night. I could not register comments because my whole password and everything has changed. I tried to register to change my password and did not get the necessary uh, message on my email to allow me to do that. So I just want to put that on the record. There's some difficulties here and thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no one else here in the chambers that wish to address the board, is there anyone on Zoom or on the phones? Yes, we do have speakers via Zoom. Michael Lewis, your microphone is now available. Good morning, supervisors. This is Michael Lewis. I live in Live Oak. I publish a weekly compendium of local government meetings called Santa Cruz Online. Unfortunately, because of the problems with the calendar system, my readers were not able to uh, click to attend this meeting, and I hope that they knew how to do it as I did by using the same contact number for Zoom to get to the meeting. Um, I wanted to talk to you this morning about another su subject that is equally important, and that has to do with the advisory bodies, particularly our commissions that serve the Board of Supervisors by providing advice based on uh, input from the public. Over the years, our commissions have drifted somewhat from neglect. And now the procedures for running these commissions vary from commission to commission. There's no consistency in agendas. There's no consistency in running the meetings. Uh, there is no consistency in advice by staff given to the commissions on how to conduct meetings. And this is resulting in some difficulties in our commissions, as many of you are aware. Um, I think it's necessary for the supervisors to come up with a handbook for new and prospective commissioners, as well as existing commissioners and staff on the founding documents for our commissions, such as County Code, the Brown Act, and even the bylaws of each individual commission, so that commissioners have the, what they need to conduct efficient meetings 
that serve not only the Board of Supervisors, but the public. And I hope uh, in the future, in the very near future, that you'll work on getting such a handbook to our commissions so they can do their job effectively for you and for the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I love the way. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett. I'd like uh, three minutes. Uh, what is our taxpayer money funding? 77 years ago today, the U.S. unleashed a second atomic bomb explosion, radiation liberate obliteration of a civilian Japanese city, Nagasaki. August 6th, the U.S. pulverized Hiroshima, a population mainly of women and children. Approximately 100,000 people were killed each Ms. time. Karen, will, you, will you please address your comments the items within the sent. jurisdiction of this Our, board? Let me finish. Our county has this shame, our country has this shameful record of being the only country to drop nuclear bombs on another country. To demonstrate why, to demonstrate to the USSR that the US was the dominant and most threatening power in the world, see Oliver Stone's untold history of the United States. Today, little of our county's tax money actually benefits Santa Cruz County residents. How so? Because approximately 50% is siphoned out to the military industrial empire complex. I call on you supervisors to halt this robbery of our tax money to fund war manufacturers like Lockheed Martin. And as the Attorney General of the UN states, the world is one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. Thank Neither you, Russia Mayor. nor NATO has agreed. Krista Corwin, your microphone is now available. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Krista Corwin. I work at the <clears throat> Regional Transportation Commission, but I'm here as a member of the public to support the uh, efforts of the labor group that spoke at the beginning of this communications session, the MMA group. Um, I support public workers and uh, I, um, I think that this board should take their request seriously and understand that a 3% COLA increase is just not enough to sustain uh, a public servant's um, life and livelihood here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corwin. We have no additional speakers at this time, Chair. Thank you, then I'll return it to the board for action on the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Supervisor I'd like to comment on a few items. Um, this um, item number uh, 29 on the Veterans Village in Ben Lomond. Uh, I want to congratulate the Housing for Health staff and the Veterans Advocates for working together to solve the congressional, the contractual and cash flow uh, challenges associated with this great project in Ben Lomond. I also want to thank our State Senator John Laird and his staff for assisting with the communications with the State Housing and Community Development Department. Um, this is a tremendous project that's going to benefit a group of people, veterans, that are uh, really challenged with getting uh, their housing uh, needs fulfilled. Uh, item number 37, uh, the Boulder Creek Library completion. I'm really pleased to uh, see the Boulder Creek uh, branch re renovation is complete. Uh, we had a very nice community celebration for that in early May. Uh, and likewise, we had a great celebration this last Saturday for the reopening of the Scotts Valley branch after some improvements were completed thanks to Measure S passed by voters in June of 2016. Um, 
there is one place where we did or the voters uh, saw what the, what they voted for and it's coming to fruition. There's a big project now in, in Aptos and others have been completed or are underway. But the three uh, in, in Ben um, Felton and Boulder Creek and Scotts Valley in the 5th District, which I represented, have been completed. And again, I want to sincerely thank the voters who approved uh, Measure S in June of 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Cabot. Yeah, I'm not removing anything. Uh, I'll just uh, comment on uh, number 49, which is the approval of uh, Measure D Master Funding Agreement between the County of Santa Cruz and the County uh, Re Regional Transportation Commission uh, to go forward and fund transportation projects. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you, Supervisor Cappen. Any other comment, uh, Supervisor Friend? Sure, Mr. Chair, this will just be brief. Just a continued appreciation for our uh, Community Development and Infrastructure Department, the Public Works team on the storm damage repair. Each of our districts are seeing continued work done on the contracts today. And I just appreciate, in particular, again, uh, Steve Wiesner's work to continue to close those projects out. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Kennedy? Yeah, I have no comments today, but I will move the recommended actions. Second. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Kennedy and a second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Um, I will say that uh, with great thanks to Public Works for continuing to chip away at the storm damage repairs of some notable roads being fixed in the first district, including Schultes Road, North Rodeo Gulch, and the old Santa Cruz Highway. Uh, I will recuse myself from voting on the item 45, awarding uh, a contract for Redwood Road, as I do have family that lives on the road. All right, no further discussion. Clerk, please call, uh, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously with Supervisor Koenig recusing on item 45. Thank you. Thank you. Then we'll proceed with the regular agenda and item seven to consider in concept an ordinance amending section 1.04.140 of the Santa Cruz County Code relating to definitions associated with the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure to define the integration of two former departments into a new department known as the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure schedule ordinance for final adoption on August 23rd, 2022, as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. And for a report on this item, we have Matt Machado, our Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. Thank you and good morning, Chair and members of the board. Uh, as introduced, Matt Machado, your Deputy CAO and Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. The item before you today is, uh, is, a, is a modification to our current ordinance. It further defines uh, the results of our consolidation of planning and public works into one department. And so the ordinance before you is adding definitions to uh, define the words of um, public works, planning, the departments, and the directors as being equal to the uh, community development department and its director. And so making them all the same in our code so that as those departments, those prior departments of planning public works are referenced in the code, they'll relate now to the community development infrastructure department. And so this is a, a, a a critical step towards our transition to this consolidation. Uh, some other critical steps that I'd like to share with you today, just since we're on the topic of consolidation and transitioning into this new department, uh, we've made quite a few uh, other steps along the way. Um, your board approved our consolidated budget, which was a great milestone. Uh, we've now adopted a new logo. Uh, we have new lobby signage to represent our new department. Uh, we're working on an updated website for our new department. Um, our uh, UPC is in an interim form right now and operating very well. Uh, we're getting a lot of positive feedback from the public in terms of uh, their accessibility to us. Uh, all of our divisions are represented at this at this one um, front counter. And so we're seeing some, some big milestones going forward uh, as part of the consolidation that your board approved back in uh, about February. Um, 
Coming up, I will also add that we plan to provide a comprehensive update to this consolidation in November, and we'll get into much more detail. I would like to thank uh, all of our uh, department staff, including our assistant directors for, for the heavy lift they've been doing to, to bring our team together, to formalize it with uh, you know, a, a new website, a new logo, uh, it's a big lift. And so I appreciate everybody's efforts. I also appreciate your support. Uh, the item before you is, is an ordinance to uh, add some definitions to include the Department of Community Development Infrastructure. Uh, the recommended actions are to approve in concept ordinance amending section 1.04.140 of the Santa Cruz County Code. And secondly, to schedule the ordinance for final adoption on August 23rd. And so with that, I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director Machado. Are there any comments or questions from members of the board? Uh, yes, McPherson. Uh, Mr. Chair, this has been a long time coming, very much uh, well accepted and appreciated. Um, although we have discussed this in previous meetings uh, and previous years, for that matter, I think it's worth repeating what a great effort and what a what a tremendous uh, cooperative effort it's taken to get to this place. And it's important that our public works and planning functions uh, are collaborative and uh, customer service minded. Um, I'm very supportive of the UPC or Unified Permit Center concept and look forward to hearing more about it in November uh, and tell us how we are doing. I think this is going to, um, as you have stated, uh, the general public is very appreciative of what you have done uh, to get us here. And thank you, Mr. Machado, for leading the way and getting this uh, to become a reality. It's going to be a really uh, a high point in what we do from this day forward in our planning processes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, th thanks a lot for your report and also thank you for all the attention you give to South County. And uh, it, it says uh, no fi financial impact. Uh, would it actually be a little bit less uh, financial impact if you're consolidating the two? Uh, of course, you would have only one director, right? Uh, so there would no longer be a director of uh, planning. So so, so the one director of the community development will be the uh, director of planning and the director of public works. So there is some savings with regard to that. Uh, but the, the financial statement for the board item in front of you is just regard to changing the definitions of an, in our ordinance. Sure. So no financial impacts to an ordinance change. But yeah, you're you're right on in a sense that consolidating the two departments, we did see some um, some savings and some streamlining, which results in um, efficiencies. So yes. You bet. Okay, that's real good. And uh, just uh, thanks for the work that's going on on uh, Houlihan and Highway 152. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, I'll just add, uh, you know, great thanks and enthusiasm for this project. I mean, as you know, uh, Director Machado, uh, our permit center is one of the main ways that the public interacts with the county. Um, of course, it's also central to addressing the uh, housing crisis. The report's showing that we are the second most expensive rental market in the country. That's more important than ever to uh, reduce permit processing times and help people add new housing and rental housing uh, to our local market. So this uh, combination of planning and public works into a new department really demonstrates our commitment to improving the customer experience. And I'm also really excited about some of the developments that we've seen in terms of uh, holding ourselves accountable with permit processing times. And that dashboard that's online is really helpful in showing you know exactly, exactly how many days it's gonna take to get everything from a deck permit to a solar permit to an ADU permit. I did share that in my newsletter yesterday and it was the most clicked link. So uh, I guess I'm not the only person interested. Hopefully it'll be useful for people as they're planning their projects. Um, so with that, uh, we'll open it now for public comment. Anyone who wishes to address us on this item, please approach the podium. Yeah, agenda item seven, the consolidation of public works and the planning department. I've been dealing with planning departments and public works since 1988 extensively in this county, including environmental health and building since 1996. So I've probably been in this building a thousand times. Um, some of the definitions are really just kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if I need to go into it. 
I haven't tried to go into public works to find any more specific information about the military weaponry that was already installed when I spoke about it oh, three years ago in the city council. At that time, you could clearly go right into public works and look at the commercial sets of plans and see if these actually were the weapons that have been described. Good, I got a minute left. Um, but when the scamdemic started, public works went crazy. Gail Newell had a five-page document, I think on page five, it had about 35 different reasons why you could be out in observations of the in the public. I matched five of those at the time. Now I actually even match more. Um, it's really fascinating. You guys are just reading scripts. Maybe you guys just don't have a clue because you don't have the experience or interest because you guys are given scripts about what's going on. Um, there has been a consolidation agenda going on for quite a bit, but when the UN was established by Brock Chisholm, excuse me, he was just simply the first inspector general from 1948 to 1953. He wrote a document in 1946, how through psychiatry and stuff, you, the population was gonna be controlled. It's a document that came out in 1946 and it describes exactly what's going on. I have a personal friend who experienced a sad part of that about that. Anyway, in closing, I'm interested if the process is any easier or more difficult. I have always enjoyed working in the building and departments here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner in rural Aptos. I, um, I, I'm curious about this consolidation. Um, because of what I've read about Monterey County doing a similar action, and it did not go well. And after 15 years, they undid the consolidation because it was just too broad. And they found it was unmanageable by the staff that they had. So I'd like to know what are the criteria that will be used by this consolidated effort to measure objectively improvement in service to the public. Well, Supervisor Caput, I appreciate your pointing out that a consolidation often means less um, management overhead. There are actually, um, Mr. as I understand it, Mr. Machado is the director of the new department, but under him will be Ms. Uh, Stephanie Hansen, the director of planning. And you're shaking your head. So, <laughs> and and Carolyn Burke, the director of environmental public works. So, that's how I understood it was set up, Mr. Machado. Maybe you can ex explain and clarify for the public because whenever I am communicating regarding planning department issues, for example, the very critical document, the the general plan update, it always goes. Ms. Hansen, I want to know what this effort is going to do to help the CZU fire rebuild people. That is a nightmare. And they, it is not only being handled through the Permit Recovery Center, but they are often sent up to the regular planning department. And it is a nightmare, as you know, Supervisor McPherson. So how is this going to help them? That's my big question. And are the, the, the UPC, the Permit Center counter off hours going to be expanded? Right now it's very limited and I think by appointment only. Um, thank you. Um, are there any other comments online or on Zoom? We do have one speaker online. Oh, they've just lowered their hand. At this time we do not have any speakers chair. Okay, then I'll return it to. The... They've put their hand back All up. Right. One moment, let me check. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. This is Marilyn Garrett, and thank you so much for the comments of James Ewing Whitman and Becky Steinbrunner on the problems with this consolidation. I also have uh, learned about Monterey's problems when they consolidated and it did not work well. How this seems to me is that there are less 
services to the public and less personal uh, contact where you can meet face to face with someone who can help you and more computerized stuff. Um, praising a new logo and website um, doesn't seem to me to benefit the public in reality. So I find this very troubling along with what has been happening over the last few years of uh, let, where the public is kind of pushed out in terms of decision making on what could actually benefit the public. I'm thinking of the ordinance on the wireless communications that um, you know, proliferation of 5G antennas everywhere without any informed consent of people to be radiated and harmed 24-7. So this uh, is something if I would vote, I'd vote no on it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action. Um, move for approval. All right, motion by Supervisor Caput, second by Supervisor McPherson. Um, I wonder, uh, Director Machado, if you could just take a, a quick moment to respond to some of the general inquiries we heard and maybe clarify the public, you know, how the organization, the department will work in terms of public works versus planning decisions and some of the key metrics you'll be looking at. I know uh, obviously the combination of these departments goes far beyond uh, a mere logo uh, into some much deeper and more meaningful outcomes. Bruno, absolutely. And, um, you know, I'd start by pointing out that our new department is made up of six distinct groups and each of those groups are led by an assistant director. And so for instance, in the planning side, in the planning division, we have uh, assistant director Burke who leads our permit center. We have assistant director Hansen that leads our policy and housing group. And then on the public work side, we have assistant director Wiesner doing transportation, assistant director Edler doing special services, which is sanitation, flood control, uh, stormwater. Uh, and then we have um, assistant director Moore who leads our administration group, support services. And then um, director Carey of our capital projects leads capital projects, which includes real property. So there's distinct groups led by uh, distinct leaders, and those are assistant directors in essence. Um, with regard to um, our consolidation to serve the public, uh, we see real value in the permit center uh, with, um, in fact, we're working on right now, streamlining our, our process of review for permits. Um, and also we're streamlining how we comment and uh, we're trying to uh, simplify that a bit and allow our professional um, community to, to do the design work. Uh, historically, we've, we've been, um, we've touched on these permits pretty with a pretty heavy hand and uh, we're trying to step back a bit and promote the codes, promote safety, uh, but allow our professional consultants to do their good design work. And we're here to support that. And we're seeing success by having all of those divisions work together under a single management structure. That's the unified part of it. And uh, we think that's gonna result in better customer service. It's gonna result in uh, quicker turn turnaround times for permits. Um, I think that's even being seen right now in the RPC. The RPC today, uh, I think there are about 333 either active permits or permits ready to be processed. And uh, that's a pretty good number uh, considering it's over half of the people that have come into our, our department for a rebuild. Uh, additionally, our de combined department is working to support that RPC. We're currently working on some fact sheets to address things like fire sprinklers um, and other you know, critical pieces. Um, um, and uh, even including sewer expansion. And so there's a lot of collaboration between the different divisions and it's really helpful to be under one management structure and with a unified voice. And so I think that applies to the RPC, to the UPC, and to just about everything we do to serve the community. So hopefully that answers your question. And with regard to the dashboards, we have some dashboards up and running. We'll continue to add metrics uh, and we'll continue to 
listen and see what the public really wants to see in terms of whether it's, you know, review times, whether it's total number of permits issued, um, you know, we're willing to, to try all the metrics and see what resonates the best and serves the community the best. So it'll be a work in progress for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Director Machado. That's very helpful. And of course, uh, in the passage of the 22-23 budget, this board also committed to the success of the new combined department uh, with five new uh, planners for the Unified Permit Center. So we hope that if anything, that'll lead to uh, more in-person as touch for, for anyone who wants to take that route to applying for a permit. Um, and of course, we're also, as you said, committed to developing the online tools uh, and the FAQs as well. So people have a good sense of knowing what they're coming into before they even set foot in the building. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, Mr. Chair, I'd like to mention, yeah, this has been um, a very difficult situation, uh, unlike anything we've experienced. Um, and we, we have to meet standards of the state geological standards uh, to, to match what we want to have to happen. We have to listen to the fire department because they want to have a sprinkler system that's adequate for any rebuilt house. Uh, and if we give permits without going through the proper authorizations, we're going to be held responsible. And so uh, I, I get the the uh, frustration with a lot of people, but we just had a uh, had just had a meeting last night with uh, f folks up in the Fallen Leaf area. Uh, it's a whole different situation with a private water company that really is making this more complex than uh, it should be. But uh, people are uh, getting a better understanding and and understanding the process that we're in, and we're ahead of those many of those. Uh, agencies and areas that were burned out in the, and there's plenty of them in the state of California and our our um, record of rebuilding is ahead of the, I think just every one of them even as slow as it may be to some so um, I, I understand the frustration but also uh, we have to meet the standards of uh, whether it be fire water whatever the kid the situation may be we have to protect those people when they're rebuilding uh, in the process Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. All right, if there's no further discussion, we do have a motion to uh, accept the recommended actions or adopt the recommended actions from Supervisor Kappa, a second by Supervisor McPherson. Clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. This ordinance being approved in concept and scheduled for final adoption August 23rd, 2022. We'll now proceed to item eight. It's the Board of Directors of the Davenport County Sanitation District. I will have a public hearing to consider in concept an ordinance amending district code title three, chapter 3.08, water service charges for Davenport County Sanitation District and schedule ordinance for final adoption on August 23rd, 2022 as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. I'll officially open the public hearing. And for a presentation on this item, we have Ashley Trujillo, District Engineer. Thank you. Should I start over? That'd be great. <laughs> this is Ashley Trujillo from the Davenport County Sanitation District. Today's item is a public hearing to establish rates for bulk potable and recycled water sales by the Davenport County Sanitation District. The proposed rates for 2022-23 are $13.74 per 100 cubic feet of water for potable bulk, bulk water and $6.87 per 100 cubic feet of water for the recycled water. The proposed rates reflect the cost of producing and providing water, plus the added administrative costs for district staff to work with the individual water haulers. The recycled water rate is proposed at being currently set at 50% the bulk potable water rate to encourage conservation and recycling. Um, the district staff recommends that the board hold a public hearing upon its conclusion, and upon its conclusion, consider approval and concept of ordinance amending district code title three, chapter 3.08.205 water service charges, and direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance on the August 23rd, 2022 agenda for final adoption. And I am available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? Mr. Chair, quick Thank question. Uh, Supervisor Cap, uh, Cap, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. 
That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> well, okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Kennedy? Yeah, uh, thank you. And I just wanted to confirm that uh, the water haulers, this is a competitive rate um, that will generate sales <clears throat> just because, uh, um, you know, if, if no sales, if, if we, have, we can set a perfect rate, but if we don't have sales, then there's no revenue. I address that. So um, the the recycled water, I assume that's the one you're yeah. talking about. Yes. Yeah. So the recycled water, um, we do believe that is a competitive rate and that it should generate sales. Um, like I said, it's not being charged at the amount that it's costing to produce it. You know, we're reducing that down. Yeah. Um, we can evaluate this on a yearly basis when we set the rates. So if we find that it needs to be lower, we can look into that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Um, another question for you. Is it expected that most of the um, sales of recycled water would happen uh, for immediate customers that are piped, that water is piped to, or would be you know hauled away with trucks? So there's no piping for the recycled water. We have a truck fill station. So people could come and they could fill canisters to use at their homes for watering gardens, businesses could use it for watering their landscaping. Um, and then larger trucks can come and get the water. And we're anticipating that they would be using it for um, construction purposes during construction projects. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, is there any member of the public that wishes to address us on this item? Morning, my name is James, thank you. Ashley, uh, I don't... What was the previous cost for uh, the 100 cubic feet of water for both the potable and non-potable? That's my question. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Thank you for this report. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm interested in water um, projects throughout the county. Um, I'm curious, um, why there is no piping for a recycled water project that costs the county a lot of money to put in, costs the ratepayers a lot of money. And there is an agricultural area up there that could benefit perhaps by the use of this recycled water if it meets the, um, the Title 22 quality levels. So that leads me to, that's my first question. Why is there no piping? Is there any plan to put in a piping so that this recycled water can be used um, more widely rather than just trucking. And the second part is what uh, quality uh, tests are done on this water to assure those who are using it for their gardens that it is acceptable. Uh, putting recycled water on leafy greens generally is not advisable. So what caveat and uh, do people are, are people given at the time they get this water? And um, what tests are run? I wanna point out that the city of um, Scotts Valley provides free water, recycled water to gardeners on certain days of the week. And so I wonder uh, if that could be possible to encourage the use of recycled water, uh, especially during times of drought. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Seeing no one else here in the chambers, is there anyone online or on uh, the phones? Yes, Chair, we do have one speaker online. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, <clears throat> we're all very worried about water and drought. And I also um, find recycled water very problematic. Vicki Steinbrunner referred to Title 22 quality standards. That's an important question for you to answer. <clears throat> I understand with like the so-called pure water project of Soquel Creek Water District, um, there's no way to remove the pharmaceuticals. They admitted that even 
with all the filtering they do. Um, what we really need to see is that there are corporations that pollute are prevented from doing that, like pesticide corporations. And I want to refer you to a website uh, called geoengineeringwatch.org about weather manipulation and the drought. Ms. Ms. Garrett, will you please keep your comments focused on the Davenport Recycled that Water Project? That gives a lot of insight on water and raising rates on everything is very difficult for people to meet these increased costs everywhere you turn. Thank you. Thank you. We have no additional speakers, Chair. Thank you. Then I'll return to the board for action. Let's wait for Supervisor Coonerty, but uh, I'll move the recommended action. Second. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. This item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Uh, we'll now proceed with item nine to conduct a study session for housing for a healthy Santa Cruz, a strategic framework for addressing homelessness in Santa Cruz County six month plan, implementation and related updates. Accept and file various progress reports, ratify agreements with community bridges in the amount of $300,000, California Rural Legal Assistance Inc. in the amount of $200,000, Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County in the amount of $1,110,400 and CFSC Inc. in the amount of $95,000. Direct Human Services to return back to the board on or before February 2023 with an update on housing for a healthy Santa Cruz and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Human Services. And for a report on this item, we have our Director of Human Services, Randy Morris, and Director of Housing for Health, Robert Ratner. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Chair Koenig and supervisors and public watching. Uh, Randy Morris, Human Services, here as Chair Koenig said with Dr. Ratner, who will give the bulk of the presentation after make a few very brief introductory comments. Um, as a reminder, today is the third six-month report in of our three-year strategic plan that your board adopted a year and a half ago. So we're at the halfway uh, mark of our three-year strategic plan. Uh, Supervisor Koenig just outlined the recommended actions in front of you, um, three of which are the basics to conduct the session, uh, accept and file all the materials we submitted, which are voluminous on purpose, uh, outlining everything that we've done in the last six months and what we're looking at going forward. Um, and then the one set of contracts that, um, thank you, Chair Koenig, for listing all of them. We were in front of you in March to talk about eviction prevention. One very important component of our work is preventing homelessness and uh, your board approved us moving forward and executing the contracts that you listed, Chair Koenig, um, but we were asked to report back to you to ratify those contracts and in the materials are a report. Um, in front of you today, this being the third uh, presentation, is both a look back on what we have been working on in the last six months and a set of proposed priorities for your board's um, deliberations, public comment, uh, what to focus on looking forward. I do want to um, invite those watching um, constituents, media, anybody. Um, there's a lot of materials that we've put together. And I know often people, it's hard to kind of read through those materials, but just hear the presentation. But you're just going to hear in uh, Dr. Ratner's presentation, a brief summary of, of a large volume of materials. And we're doing what we can as a county human services department in partnership with our city jurisdictions and our other county departments to outline and describe what we're doing with a very, very complex issue trying to prevent and end homelessness. So we really do want to invite people to read those materials, make public comment, um, keep in touch with us because this is something we can only do working together. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of comments about what strikes me in the materials today looking back and what strikes me looking forward as you um, then hear uh, Robert's overview. So first, in the last six months, the COVID shelter system um, was demobilized. Uh, because of COVID, we had a, a large volume, almost $100 million of new FEMA funding to stand up a large number of shelters, and those all ended on June 30th. So we have a whole set of materials speaking to you what happened, the end of that funding and the impacts and what that means. 
We also need to highlight that every year there is a national report on housing affordability. And in the last six months, the next yearly report came out, which highlighted the county of Santa Cruz moved from the third highest cost jurisdiction in the United States of America to the second most expensive place to live in the United States of America next to the county and city of San Francisco. And when you control for income levels in a jurisdiction, we are actually the most expensive jurisdiction in the United States of America to afford housing. So that context needs to be highlighted and underlined because preventing and ending homelessness when it is that expensive to live here for our staff or for people who are struggling to keep housing or find housing um, is very uh, significant. To address that issue, we have a um, historic opportunity with the state of California in the Project Home Key effort. Um, you just passed an item in consent on Vets Village, one of our Project Home Key applications to help develop more affordable housing. And in the last six months, two of those four um, applications have been awarded. And finally, the every other year point in time count that was delayed one year because of COVID um, is in draft and we put in the materials a highlight of the findings and hope that we can have some discussion about what that means because that is a significant moment when we do that point in time count to give us an idea of what's in front of us. Um, I want to end my comments about what strikes me about looking forward. I think we need to constantly have a discussion about not just focusing on what to do with those who are unsheltered and how to manage the various issues in front of us, but the issue of preventing homelessness is gonna be a more profound issue in the upcoming year with the economy getting more strained, income inequality worsening, and as I said earlier, the cost of living getting more and more difficult in our community. Doing anything we can to create more affordable housing has to be a key. Um, I also think that it's worth noting that though we have had an infusion of federal and state money and the economy has been relatively strong, we are preparing for a recession and we are built upon, as was shared in our budget hearings with your board um, in June, a lot of one-time money from federal and state sources. So as we brace ourselves for a recession and the federal and state funding that really funds about 95% of the work we do in housing for health is something that's going to really challenge us and we're going to have to keep... Um, communicating about. And my final comment um, here as a county staff person in front of the Board of Supervisors, I want to end my comments by recognizing the importance of the collaboration that we as staff have with you as our elected officials. And this is the um, last six month presentation where Supervisor Caput and Supervisor Coonerty are going to be seated members of the board. And I just want to recognize Supervisor Caput in your work with the city of Watsonville, what really struck me as I thought about this is my last time to be in front of you. You literally have an office in where one of our shelters were and would walk through the shelters and meet people and talk to us and really wanna recognize your support for a very complicated issue as the city of Watsonville has been struggling and supervisor community had a chance to share this with you privately, but your leadership with um, the complications in the city of Santa Cruz, a former mayor, a former elected there, We've worked a lot with you and your staff and really want to recognize this is our last chance. And um, a lot of what we've done has been thanks to the success of working with you and Supervisor McPherson and the two by two with complicated issues with um, the city of Santa Cruz. So I just feel like I wanted to note this will be our last chance in front of uh, the two of you and appreciate your support. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ratner um, and he and we have a PowerPoint presentation and look forward for uh, public comment and dialogue with your board. Thank you, Randy, and thank you, members of the board and the public for this chance to provide an update on how we're doing relative to our Housing for Healthy Santa Cruz framework that was adopted nearly a year and a half ago. Um, this is going to be an update for the six month period of our work together between January and June and going on the next. Um, the overview of what I'm going to cover today is similar to what's in the board packet. A uh, review of what we've accomplished and worked on over the past six months. Randy alluded to we completed a point in time count of people experiencing homelessness in our community. So we'll provide a high level update on that and how we're doing relative to goals in the framework that the board had adopted. Uh, provide an update on the status of temporary housing, shelter and transitional housing and our rehousing wave effort as the shelters that were stood up during the COVID pandemic have closed down over the past few months. Then a little bit more information on affordable housing and project home key and talking about the prevention related contracts that are part of the board packet. And then the last item I wanted to cover is a partnership between our agency, the new community development infrastructure department and the health service agency to get some more supportive housing resources out to the community.
So over the past six months uh, and at our last meeting, we had identified 26 key areas uh, where were milestones or goals that we wanted to try to accomplish. And we actually partially or fully completed all of those milestones. And I wanted to highlight a few of those items for the board. Um, we executed over $1.6 million worth of contracts related to eviction and homelessness prevention. And our team will be working significantly closely with members of different community based organizations to try to help people keep their housing. As Randy indicated, we have a lot of concerns about the impact of the recession and rising housing costs on the community's ability to retain housing. Our rehousing wave effort uh, helped a lot of households get into permanent housing um, prior to the closure of our COVID shelters. 145 households moved into permanent homes, and we're still working with many of those households to help them secure permanent homes. We deepened our partnership with Central California Alliance for Health. I think a lot of people aren't aware that the state of California, particularly through the Department of Healthcare Services, has shifted a lot of funding to Medi-Cal managed care agencies to engage in the issue of housing and homelessness. So the partnership with our local Medi-Cal managed care plan is really critical. So we worked on applications for funding and uh, we're developing plans of collaborating around contracting. And I think that'll be an important thing for us to, to look at over the next uh, six month period as well. We had submitted four applications for Project Home Key, which is this incredibly unique state funding opportunity to create more supportive housing at a pace that's um, unprecedented in California. Of our four applications, two of them have received award announcements. Uh, one received an initial denial that we're appealing, and another one is still in process, and we're hopeful that it will get funded. We're also planning to apply for some additional funds. Um, and then we launched a new structure for how we work together under a federal requirement of um, establishing a continuum of care a group of organizations and people coming together to prevent net homelessness. And um, we started that new process over the last six months. So one of the key things about our framework is there was goals established in two areas. Um, well, there's overall goal in terms of reductions of homelessness and unsheltered homelessness, um, but how we were gonna get there, there were some capacity targets, how much capacity we wanted to add to our system in Santa Cruz County in certain areas and improving the performance of the organizations that are working to prevent end homelessness. So this slide shows you how we're doing relative to our targets uh, baseline prior to the framework being adopted and the trend lines. So you'll see for temporary housing, which includes shelter and transitional housing in the community, before the um, pandemic and before the framework was adopted, there were around 440 beds and our target in our framework is 600. We exceeded that during the pandemic, we were over a thousand beds, but because of the reductions in federal funding, and other sources, we've dropped below our baseline um, during this period. So one of the key things we're working on over the next six months is to ramp up our shelter and transitional housing capacity. Uh, rapid rehousing slots have remained uh, steady since the last six month period, but we're far below the target of 490 that uh, was a part of the framework. And permits for housing, we've exceeded our goals and the number of units, but the permits for housing we've secured is vouchers that need to be used in the private rental market. And because the private rental market is so tight, people often have vouchers that are really difficult for them to use. So we have work to do to create more building-based supportive housing where there's actually a structure that's built with that purpose, like the Veterans Village that was discussed earlier and continuing to deepen our partnerships with the private rental market to create more opportunities for folks who have those vouchers to help make housing more affordable. And then um, the bottom area is uh, a conservative goal that we established in the framework of meeting our RENA, regional housing needs allocation targets for creating more very low income housing in Santa Cruz County. And the eight year targets, which um, are a target for December, 2023, were 734 new units. And we saw an increase in this last six months up from 103 to 151 units, but we've got a ways to go to get to our RENA targets. And um, one of the key things that's in the framework is tracking how we're doing over time with uh, the annual point in time counts. The, the goal for the overall framework is to reduce unsheltered homelessness, people with no safe shelter by 50% and 25% reduction in overall homelessness. 
And what the 22 uh, point in time count showed us is that we've got a really mixed situation in terms of how we're progressing on these goals. With families, uh, with children and youth, we saw significant progress in the 22 uh, data compared to where we were in 2019. You can see in the slide that uh, the number of unsheltered families dropped 94% and overall 59%, which is definitely on target with our goals. Young people uh, went down 61% in terms of sheltered and overall. But we saw significant increases in adult-only households, 25 years and older, and the bulk of those increases were among certain subpopulations of people who are more likely to experience homelessness. So veterans went up significantly, seniors and people with disabilities, and folks who've been homeless for a long period of time. We saw increases in the numbers of people in those categories. So what that says to me is we, over the next months, really need to do more work to help people with behavioral health conditions in particular, mental health and substance use issues. Um, folks who were self-reported they were struggling with those challenges went up significantly. Um, and we also have to really connect our services to housing to help folks with disabilities to be able to be successful in those units. So I think that's a real key focus for us over the next six months. And part of that is applying for more project home key funds and supporting those projects to go forward. This slide just is a quick overview of how our, and I alluded to this earlier, how our shelter and transitional housing capacity has evolved. And a lot of different policymakers will debate what's the right amount of temporary housing to have in a community. There's a few jurisdictions around the United States that have a right to shelter, for example, New York State and the city of New York, but they still have tremendously large homeless populations and they invest a lot of public dollars in shelter. So I think there's trade-offs in using public funds for temporary housing versus permanent housing. Here we established a target of 600 and we're not there yet. So we've got work to do to raise the money um, to get us to that point. I uh, project we have a gap of around eight to $12 million, depending on the types of shelter and transitional housing we're trying to create to get to that 600 bed capacity. One way in which we're trying to close that gap is through a partnership with the Central California Alliance for Health because their um, Cal-AIM, Medi-Cal Managed Care role and engaging more in helping their members who are on Medi-Cal and part of their managed care plan includes um, post-hospitalization shelter. So we're gonna be working with them on at least one project to expand shelter and temporary capacity for people who are their members and in the healthcare system. And then I think we'll need to continue doing some fundraising and looking at um, finding appropriate locations and operators for more temporary housing. Uh, this slide talks about a rehousing way, which we created um, about a year and a half ago to support the guests at our COVID-19 uh, shelters that we knew we were going to close. There's three uh, housing navigation case management teams, uh, both services, housing matters and our own division. We have a contract with the both services to partner with private rental um, owners and property managers. We have a flexible rehousing fund to help pay for application fees and furniture for folks who are participating in the program. We had a really generous and um, critical commitment from the housing authority to link uh, one-time emergency housing vouchers with the effort. And the Vets Hall Board of Trustees that's been involved with the Vets Village Project also was involved with helping with care packages and move-in supports for folks as part of this effort. Uh, we've been operational for about 13 months uh, with this collective team effort and 323 people have gotten services and 145 have moved into permanent housing. And I think that number will be grow growing um, between this presentation and the next one. And then emergency housing vouchers, I was just in a meeting with our colleagues in the housing authority and um, as a jurisdiction, we're uh, way above average na nationally and in California in terms of the use of those vouchers, which is, I think, a reflection of the board's commitment and our community's commitment to bringing these resources together to help folks use that one time set of vouchers uh, from the federal government. And uh, we look forward to finding opportunities for those with vouchers that haven't been able to secure housing yet and look forward to continuing that partnership with the private rental market. And as the bottom says, our biggest challenge, because that's our permanent support of housing that requires a partnership with those that own private property, is finding available rental units in a tight market. And uh, part of how we're doing 
uh, work in that area is we're talking to people about uh, options outside of the county if they're struggling to find a location here because the particular vouchers that we have, um, the emergency housing vouchers allow for people to use them outside of Santa Cruz County right away. Normally vouchers require that you move into a unit within the county for a year before you transfer out. So we're, we're continuing to really explore that with folks uh, and, and uh, other places that they would be willing to consider living. Uh, Randy alluded to this uh, statistic, and I'd prefer not to present this information. I'm hoping in 2023 we see the trend line going in the other direction. Um, but the National Low Income Housing Coalition produces an annual report uh, looking at the cost of rental housing across the country. Randy alluded to the fact that uh, we went from being number three most expensive rental market to number two in just a year. And we um, stand out also in terms of the average wage um, and income of households that are renting requires that people have 3.1 jobs at that average wage to be able to afford a two bedroom apartment. I want to provide that a little bit of context for those numbers and um, one is if uh, like a, a typical minimum wage worker, uh, you need four full-time jobs to afford a two-bedroom apartment. So you'd have to have two people working two full-time jobs to be able to make housing affordable here. And then for our rehousing wave, which I just talked about, a lot of our staff who are doing the housing navigation and case management work can't actually afford to live here. They need to work 60 hours a week on their salaries to make housing affordable for them. So emotionally and psychologically, uh, kudos to the staff that continue to do this work. Um, even when they're struggling with housing on their salaries, they're still working really hard to help people find housing. And so uh, I think it's critical as we talk about homelessness to remember that the affordable housing issues in our community um, are really uh, impactful just beyond the issue of homelessness. Homelessness, I think, is the kind of tip of the iceberg, the worst case scenario um, when there is housing aboard affordability challenges, but it impacts employers' ability to keep and retain workers, extends commute times, um, the stress on people's lives when they're spending so much of their income on housing uh, has health impacts as well. Wanted to share how we're doing on the regional housing needs uh, allocation goals relative to other communities in the Central Coast. And you can see here that um, San Benito has only um, just got close to 1% of their very low income housing goals. Santa Cruz were at 21%. Um, Monterey and San Luis Obispo have gotten closer to their very low income housing goals. One of my personal goals over the next six months is to take a look at the point in time count data across California. I have a hypothesis that communities that are moving closer to hitting their very low income RENA goals are more likely to see reductions in homelessness. Monterey and San Luis Obispo, their point in time counts were released and they both saw reductions in the numbers of people experiencing homelessness. So I think there's a correlation between local support for more affordable housing development and progress on the issue of homelessness. So I, I hope that we can continue across all of our jurisdictions in the county to get closer to our, our goals um, with this cycle of RENA. I alluded to this earlier, and this is a slide that I've shared before. Just um, our division is called Housing for Health. And part of how I shifted from being a healthcare practitioner to getting into housing is I saw that the impact of housing struggles on people's overall health and well being, um, behavioral health issues, physical health issues. And in the context of a, a community where housing is incredibly expensive, um, any one stress in someone's life can tip people into an, a period of housing instability. Uh, they may need to leave the area, uh, the term displacement, when people have to move, even though they've got support and job opportunities here. Um, the next level of, I think, severe Im impacts is people having to couch surf or move from one place to another, or hotels. Um, we have very large numbers of families um, in the Department of Education definition of homelessness, which is broader than the one we're talking about today, but a fair number of families are struggling with housing instability. And then literal homelessness, um, where people are actually on the streets or in any of our shelters. And as those housing stability issues become more intense, the likelihood of health issues um, increase significantly. 
there's a series of studies that show folks who experience homelessness for long periods of time are uh, more likely to die 20, kind of 25 years earlier than the general population. So the health impacts of not having a stable place to live are, are really significant. And I think that's one of the reasons why our managed care partners are getting more engaged in the issue as well. Uh, what are we doing about creating more affordable housing? We're working on home key and other funding opportunities. Uh, round one, our county didn't apply for the initial home key funding. In round two, we submitted four applications. Um, this slide talks about the two projects that have already received awards and our hope that the other two will get funding. And we're planning for additional applications in the next round. We have one project we're working on in the unincorporated area of Watsonville to create a new transitional housing program for youth experiencing homelessness. And we're partnering with Midpen Housing and um, Housing Matters on some projects around their Coral Street campus. So we expect at least one application going in round three and likely more to secure more um, resources to help us get closer to our arena goals and more building-based supportive housing. Uh, one other strategy we're using is uh, through a partnership with the Health Services Agency. Both of our agencies, even though we're not housing agencies, I think both Health and Human Services realize that for the people we serve to be um, healthy and to thrive, they need to have stable places to live. So the Health Services Agency secured whole person care funding um, a few years ago that they're committing to support the creation of more uh, housing for people with mental illness. And then our department applied for funding from the California Department of Social Services to get some funding for people with disabilities. So the two departments agreed we would combine those pots of money and create a request for proposals process over the next six months to get that money out the door and try to create as many units as possible at the lowest price possible um, for the investment. So uh, I hope this is a trend for us in the county in general of increasing our investments and creating more affordable housing and supportive housing in particular. And then wanted to end with what are the big things that uh, we as staff uh, have uh, planned for the next six months. The materials that we submitted to the board have a much longer list, but these are the things that really stand out um, from a staff perspective. So uh, this slide also shows the kind of four areas that we articulate in the framework that we're focusing on. Building a coalition, we all need to lean in and make changes in our lives and our work to, to make an impact on this issue. And um, the build a coalition is intended with that kind of spirit in mind. So we are going to be managing a process to secure some more HUD funding over the next six months. There's some increases coming from the federal government to address homelessness, and we want to be competitive for those dollars. Uh, the partnership with managed care. And then we are working on updating our standard policies for how we assess and match people experiencing homelessness to resources. Uh, Randy alluded to the a focus on preventing homelessness. We've created a, a movement toward a centralized, more easily accessible, at least that's our intention, fund to help people with housing related needs, both preventing the loss of housing, but also helping people get back into housing. We're relaunching an effort for seniors and people with disabilities who contact APS that have housing instability issues. Um, we're expanding that program thanks to some new funding from the state. And then we want to support the eviction and homelessness prevention efforts of our contractors and organizations doing that work. Uh, in terms of connections, we have some resources to expand outreach uh, to folks who are unhoused. I think that it's going to be really important. We outreach to veterans. If you look at the data, we also have a lot of veterans who are unsheltered. That, and I think we can rally around that and try to help get them connected to services. And then uh, expanding the temporary housing. And then most importantly, I think expanding permanent housing through the mechanisms that we talked about earlier in the presentation. And that's the end of our overview. And we're happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you both. Other comments or questions from members of the board? Hey, Mr. Chair, I have a brief question. Thank you, Dr. Ratner. Uh, friend. Yes, um, I, I just had a question specifically regarding the veterans outcomes and the point in time count that just came forward. You uh, spoke a little bit about the veterans at the end. And aside from the veterans village, recognizing that there is the HUD VASH availability, and aside from just pure outreach, what is really uh, preventing us from getting that down to a functional zero. I was under the impression that uh, it wasn't necessarily a limit, uh, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't necessarily a limit of HUD-VASH uh, vouchers, just of people willing 
locally to provide the housing or rooms for people? Is it a combination and more complicated than that? And it really is an outreach issue where veterans aren't aware of what's available, or is it simply just a room and housing availability issue in order to improve those numbers? I was surprised to see, recognizing the point in time count and all of its flaws uh, for uh, trying to drill down on a number, but I was just surprised to see uh, any sort of veteran increase. Yeah, thanks for the question, Supervisor Friend. I was also surprised, and I think many other people in the community, because we were making progress on the issue over the past counts and seeing reductions, and I think there was a lot of hopefulness that we could get to functional zero. We need to do a little bit more research to understand what's actually happening. Um, the number of households that have VASH vouchers that haven't been able to find housing has gone down significantly, in part because of our rehousing wave efforts. Um, there are, I think, still around 40 to 50 veterans who have vouchers that haven't been able to use them. So our home key projects that we alluded to, um, if all those come into fruition, all those folks who have VASH vouchers will have 50 units. So I think there is a shortage of VASH vouchers to meet the need among veterans. I think the other major issue is that the VA programs are mostly available for people that have honorable or other than honorable discharge status. And what I've seen over my career is um, individuals, particularly people with health issues or mental health or substance use issues that have dishonorable discharges and identify as veterans, have a really hard time accessing VA resources. And I have a concern that that's a part of the story here. And I think as we get more outreach out into the field and identify veterans, we'll know if the issue is they're just not eligible for VA resources or if they're just not connected. Um, and it, I think that this community has been deeply invested in addressing homelessness among veterans. So I, I think we'll be able to make a push to try to turn things in the right direction once we get a little bit more information about what's going on. Dr. Ratner, that's, that's very helpful. So for me just to understand, and, and I think maybe for the community at large, when we see these numbers of, these are self-identification numbers, I imagine through the point in time count, and therefore there could be some uh, fluidity by which uh, those numbers are reported. It might make a headline that somebody may self-identify as a veteran uh, that may or may not qualify specifically for the services, may actually not even be a veteran, but uh, and in particular also on some of the family identifications. So some of this is just uh, the underlying challenge with data collection with this population. And some of this um, is also just the structural issues regarding housing, cost of living, and, and availability of those things. Um, but I, I, um, I appreciate that, that additional information. And it just strikes me that it just seems like a population that the community, I mean, in also families as well, which has shown the decline, uh, really should be the easiest, nothing's easy, but the easiest to rehouse um, if the community is willing to open up its doors for those with these, uh, with the vouchers. Thank, Agreed. You. Thank you for the comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor uh, McPherson. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, not disturbing, but uh, I wish it wasn't all realistic report um, and homelessness. We have a tremendous challenge, uh, really unlike anybody else in the nation or few in the nation with our housing costs and so forth. I do appreciate um, this report. Um, and I uh, had some concerns uh, echoed by uh, Supervisor Friend. Um, you mentioned the, the relocation into permanent supportive housing in other communities. Is there, and maybe you touched on it, but is there anything else we can do to try to push that? I mean, everybody says, to, you know, put your homeless someplace else. But uh, so how can we, um, you know, shall we say, uh, speed that process up? Yeah, I think one of the, uh, observations I have is that the populations that are the least likely to be able to relocate are the ones with disabilities that need a lot of support. Um, so individuals that have access to transportation, family support networks, uh, I think this is part of why we're seeing some reductions in family and youth homelessness yeah. is that there's a little bit more mobility and ability to, to leave the area. Um, the level of uh, functional impairments among people experiencing homelessness and the aging of the population um, I don't think I can convey how how stark it is um, and the living conditions that people are in. Um, it's a reflection of closures of skilled nursing facilities, licensed board and cares. So we have people with really significant health issues 
um, that need a lot of support to get back into housing. And I think that's one of the reasons why, if you just look at a snapshot in time, which the point in time count does, that really stands out in the data, that we have a lot of people in our community who have struggled um, with significant health issues. And it's really challenging to help them locate to another community without knowing that those supports are there to help them yeah. keep their housing. Um, part of that process is uh, partnering with our managed care entity and seeing how we can work across counties to make sure that if people are going from one county to another, that those supports are there, that they need to be successful in housing. Right. Um, and I, I think the other is that uh, just acknowledging and, and having more realistic conversations. Uh, I know we, we talk about this at the staffing level with staff who are struggling to be able to afford to live here and the trade-offs. We have to have those conversations with people who are unhoused or struggling as well, um, analyzing the pros and cons of staying in the current situation versus taking a unit in another community. Um, and I, I think that folks are doing more and more of that. One of the concerns that I hear a lot from uh, folks who do this work is that, well, are you just throwing your hands up? Does that mean you're not going to try to build affordable housing? And I don't think that's what we're saying. Trying to acknowledge the reality at the moment while we're simultaneously trying to work on the affordable housing issue and not let people suffer and stay in situations um, while we're waiting for years because these projects take years to develop. Um, so I think it's an ongoing community conversation. I think if members that do this work feel like we're collectively committed to addressing the affordable housing issue locally. I think there'll be a little bit more comfort with doing work to help folks find other options. I think it, it becomes this either or, either you ship everybody out or you build housing for everybody here. And I, I think for me that it's a more nuanced approach, really honoring people's choices and the options and the reality of the moment while we work on the long-term issues at the same time. And, um, and Supervisor McPherson, yeah, if yeah. I can just jump in and share, um, as a human service professional, I feel like I need to call out the human element, both recognizing what Robert referred to as our staff and what a tough conversation that is to have, but also um, that the population is very diverse that we're serving and it's hard to parse out, but I want to recognize that some, this is their community. And being offered an opportunity to move somewhere else where they would lose all of their connections, even if they've been here for a long period of time, is a very complicated conversation to have. And, you know, to make the public policy comment, adults have a right to self-determination and we can't tell people to leave. So I think I just want to recognize the staff who are working directly with people who are having these conversations. We can keep doing what Robert said, but in the end of the day, um, it's a really complicated moment. And some people, this is their home. I, I can understand that. Um, you know, they have, this is home to them. So you don't want to move them from home. Uh, but um, more specifically, the number, the large number of persons experiencing homelessness on the self um, reported substance abuse. Um, do we know how many of these folks reported uh, and both of these issues, uh, homelessness and, and need of, uh, well, uh, substance abuse issues? I, I've heard of the third, maybe up to a half, maybe. Yeah, so the, um, the full data for the point in time um, report will come out um, in the next couple of weeks, um, but it's a really significant percentage in Santa Cruz County. So uh, on the positive side, when uh, talking about recovery from addiction, one of the first steps is acknowledging you have an issue. So the fact that people are willing to acknowledge um, through a survey process that they're struggling with an issue, I think to me is an indication that people are more receptive to getting connected to treatment. Um, and it's a really significant uh, change between 2019 and 2022, the numbers of people who are struggling with and reporting mental health and substance use issues. Um, I'll, I'll say that it's over half, you'll see in the report of the folks in the survey. And the number of people who reported having a health condition that they felt was disabling was close to three quarters of the population. So earlier in my statements around the, the folks who are unhoused here are really struggling with significant health issues that make returning to work and getting back into housing really challenging. Um, and, and I think we'll have to do, and we have um, emphasized in our next six month plan, kind of working more closely with behavioral health and trying to help get people engaged with treatment and bringing in more resources to address that issue. Thank you, understood and very disturbing. Yeah. Um, um, 
And I, I think the coordination between the units as you're trying to do is, is uh, essential. Um, I'd like to see the board, and this is a 25 page report and uh, it's very thorough, but uh, for us to have a maybe a study session, the healing of the streets uh, for both funding and operations and what coordination looks like. Um, and maybe within a six month period or before January, so we can have the input of uh, supervisors Coonerty and Caput. Um, but um, I um, also in saying that, <laughs> There's this really push for more housing, and we haven't in Santa Cruz County been able to reach our arena numbers. And now the state is saying you've got to increase those by three or four times. And if we did that, uh, the impact on our other infrastructure of water, transportation, et cetera, would be immense. Um, I think we need to do it. We need to address it. But it's it's a full blown problem that reaches out to other areas besides housing, uh, and the impact it'll have on other residents of Santa Cruz County. Um, I really appreciate your broad view of this and giving us the true facts of, of this disturbing information that you've you've presented. But um, we'll just keep working at it. And I really appreciate the coordinated effort that you have put forth to this point. Uh, I think it's going to help us to get to a, a better um, a solution to our housing crisis in Santa Cruz County. Supervisor McPherson, can I just recognize what I heard as um, a request for the board to consider having us come back the next time we're scheduled to be back in six months would be after um, Supervisors Caput and Coonerty um, are not here and if i heard that right in the reference to the nexus of mental health services in our division uh could i recommend that we consider if we do this if this was your board likes that we wait until after the state makes a final decision on um the care court the care and court yeah because that's i think sure. the um if that legislation passes and what it looks like and whether or not there's funding will be a profound game changer and i feel like it would be premature to have that discussion if it's pending a state final action. And yeah. we didn't get into that today, but that would be absolutely profound and would probably be gummed up in court systems. But it's I, an effort by our governor to try to address this issue and have people have various I, opinions, but that's going to be significant whether that passes or not. I, I agree. And, I, and the state uh, legislature and the governor should decide that this month. Um, maybe we'll wait to see what they do and just get a guess uh, of what impact that might have. And so um, let's wait for a scheduled study session until we see what the state does and then see how we might approach it if we can at all. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for this presentation. Um, as as was mentioned, this may be my last. Although Supervisor McPherson uh, <laughs> seemed maybe adding maybe adding a a, a new hearing on. But um, you know, in thinking about the progress we've made over the past eight years um, and the challenges ahead, um, I sort of came to really six, three generally positive, three challenges that, that I see for future policymakers and those implementing the policy and, um, you know, in the, at the risk of, uh, of putting a big burden on um, the next people who are sitting in these seats. I think, um, you know, the positives are what I'm seeing is that this is really data driven. And for the first time, we're starting to get a handle on uh, what the challenge is and, and how we're doing and addressing it and um, that the board can keep putting pressure uh, on this issue and keep a focus on this issue by these through these hearings, through these working through plans and through being transparent with the community about where where we're making progress uh, and where we're not, I think is really important. The second one is that I like this emphasis on prevention. Um, it's really, uh, if you think about the pain um, that uh, a person or a family will experience, uh, experiencing even brief homelessness uh, and the impacts the community and the cost of the system, the more we can spend up front, uh, the better. And then the, the third part that I really want to celebrate is uh, I understand the limitations of a pit count, but the but the progress we made on families and unsheltered families um, is is incredible, and uh, I really appreciate those who have advocated over the years uh, for this, including uh, my staff, Alison Endert. This was her, one of her primary issues, and the fact that we were able to make um, significant change, I think, is a big deal. 
When I look at the challenges, um, first is this uh, more than doubling of people who were chronically homeless or fell under the definition of chronically homeless. Um, you know, a, even with the problems of the pig count, that is a troubling issue because I think it signals um, uh, a real challenge ahead. And also the fact that we may be um, uh, having people who are chronically homeless coming to Santa Cruz. And even if it's only a fraction of those, given the complexity of the cases and the difficulty in finding housing, um, we have to make sure that Santa Cruz uh, County and specifically Santa Cruz City is not trying to solve um, what is a national problem uh, what, where other counties uh, through different policies are um, pushing people this way. Likewise, I think um, the the numbers around substance use um, are challenging, and until we recognize the significant role that specifically meth is playing um, in this, uh, in as as part of the, as a driver of this uh, of this crisis, and until we can um, do a better job at intervention um, and treatment, I think I think we're going to see um, even more difficult. Uh, problem. And then finally, to the exchange that just occurred, I think it's really critically important that um, that we be clear that we will that any strategy that is predicated on housing people in this community um, is destined to fail. And that has real consequences um, if we are um, giving people a sense that there's a path to housing where even if we get a lot of dollars and build a lot of housing and take on a lot of neighborhoods and all that, we can at best maybe house one out of every 10 maybe one out of every eight people um, who are experiencing homelessness in this county, uh, and that that leaves a lot of people on lists to nowhere. And we need, as a, as a community, to recognize that it's not about putting people on buses and just getting them out of our community, uh, but it is about finding places where people, the, the work, um, housing, balance is is more in line uh, and they will have more opportunity to be supported and whether we are um, not only paying for folks to relocate but support when they get there I think is key um, because it is um, we are otherwise we are fighting an uphill battle and as long as we hold on to this idea that we just have to wait for you know literally thousands of affordable units to be built um people should 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 subsist um trying to survive is not a humane uh, or practical approach for either the, the people experiencing homelessness or the community Thank you all for letting uh, indulging me in my observations after all these years of and scars of trying to address this issue. Um, but I appreciate the work and I appreciate the forum and the opportunity to 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 be data driven in this conversation. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. Supervisor Cabot. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for your kind words. And uh, I want to uh, thank both of you for all the hard work and great work that you've been uh, doing over the past months, uh, dealing with uh, uh, critical issues that are facing us locally. And uh, I know it's very difficult. I'm, I, I only had one quick question, and I'm not sure how to phrase it, but... Uh, when there's uh, specifically working with uh, veterans, uh, there is money for programs. Do, does the federal government uh, offer money for programs and then it comes to the county and you have to look for it? Or do you have to go look for it before and uh, try to, you know, get money? So uh, when it comes from the federal government, it... it it has to go through the county, right? Uh, uh, how to spend it? I'm going to make a comment about something that many California County Human Services Departments manage, including us. That answers your question directly. And then I'll turn it over to Robert to speak to more of the world of affordable housing and services. The only direct funding that f flows from feds to state to county human services is a veteran services office. So as you know, we have the veteran services office. You've worked with them. 
And it is not an entity that receives money to deliver services. It is primarily an office that helps veterans navigate federal and state programs. Okay. So it's basically an in-between to help NAP. So we very often get calls to say, I'm struggling, I need to appeal something, but the services are from the feds in the state. And then some of what the Veteran Service Office does is um, federal and state law asks a local veteran service office to sort of confirm somebody as a veteran in order to basically stamp a piece of paper, sometimes literally, so they can be eligible for something. But all of that something comes from somewhere else. So that's a very small veteran service office, very small programs in, in uh, California County Human Services. I'll turn it over to Robert to speak to the issues of the vouchers and the housing and um, kind of homeless services that are traditionally not directly run by human services. Yeah, the veterans resources to help prevent and end homelessness are managed by the VA at the federal level and they issue requests for proposals and typically county governments are not involved. Nonprofit organizations often apply directly to receive those funds and there was just a round recently where some of our local nonprofits applied for some additional funding for a program called supportive services for veterans and their families. And then the, the VASH vouchers, the VA Supportive Housing Program, is a partnership between the VA and HUD and the local housing authorities. So uh, one of the issues I think that we have to work on over the next six months is how do we, because the VA has in some ways created a separate system that has made a lot of progress nationally in addressing veterans homelessness, we've got to figure out how to connect in more with the system and understand our point in time count data um, and our HMIS data are not synchronized with the VA's data, as an example. Um, being data driven, I appreciate it. <laughs> Supervisor could you mention that? We've got to be able to understand um, where are the veterans that are not connected, why are they not connected, and um, do that from a place of partnership because we aren't actually managing those resources directly. So we want to just be at the table with the VA and figure this out together. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. Uh, basically, uh, and it's uh, very similar to what we're doing with the uh, Home Key Project with in Boulder Creek uh, with the veterans uh, uh, housing there, right? Some some similarities, some differences. I mean, in the case of our Home Key Projects, we're a co-applicant for funding and for the VA resources, that's generally not required. Nonprofit organizations can apply without a county or local jurisdiction supporting the application. Um, and I think the other difference, well, let's see, let me move away from difference. The Veterans Village Project is uh, an example of, I think this is what you're getting at with Supervisor Caput, partnering with the VA. So right. we applied for this funding to help the VA and the Vets Hall Board of Trustees address homelessness among veterans. And we did that with multiple home key projects because we saw an opportunity for us to bring in some money that we qualify for to pair with their federal money. And I think that's an example of what we need to do more of is figuring out, I mean, we have another example, actually, we are taking some state funding to help the VASH program find some resources to create incentives for private property owners to take in folks with VASH vouchers. So that's another uh, example of what I think you're talking about, partnering with the VA resources by bringing in other resources. You bet. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Supervisor Captain. I'll make a few remarks. I, I want to start by just uh congratulating the entire team uh working on this to uh, for the reduction in homelessness among families and youth i mean a 94 percent reduction in unsheltered families uh is amazing and i think we need to celebrate our accomplishments where we can get them so um you know this is such a huge and complicated issue and i think really this this shows the way to how we can begin to tackle it was we've got to break it out into uh chunks that we can meaningfully uh accomplish and so um you know it's great that we took this focus on families and youth and and made this kind of progress i think as a supervisor friend and supervisor caput have alluded to uh, veterans are a next logical group uh, to focus on and really try to make substantive inroads into reducing homeless being, homelessness among that population, while of course continuing our commitment to youth and families. Uh, I have a, just a few questions. Um, so the first is, we talked about the the gap in funding to to reach our the number of shelter beds 600 the goal from about 300 and I think it's 82 today, uh, costing eight to 12 million dollars. Is that 
the one-time funding we would need to, to get those beds in place, uh, or is that ongoing funding that we would need annually? Thank you for that clarifying question. It's ongoing funding to support the operations of those programs. And one of the trends in Santa Cruz County is that we've had a lot of one-time investments in shelter that would be open for six to nine months, and then we close it. And I think for us to be successful, we've got to find ongoing stable sources to keep quality programs going and helping folks go from homelessness to housing. And the 8 to 12 million figure does include a, a potential uh, amount we would need for capital. I think there's more resources available for one-time capital funding. It's the ongoing operational dollars that are really a, a big hole that we need to fill. And may, may I piggyback on that? If your board agrees between now and the next strategic plan, and certainly my recommendation is when we develop a next strategic plan, I think we would advance the effort if we um, not only parsed out everything we're doing and it's some component parts, but I think the issue of funding needs to be broken out into what I think is behind your question. What is one-time money versus what is ongoing money for all the various interventions? Because it's very complicated to explain the universe of this issue from prevention to encampments and everything in between. And then throw out numbers as we do because we're getting more experience at saying what things cost, but parsing out those numbers so that elected officials and constituents and advocates can sort of better understand the trade offs. Because this is never going to get solved by county general fund or city general fund. County and city general fund sort of chip away at or leverage things. But in the end, we need to be very thoughtful about how to grab federal and state money. And I think to what your question is, if I'm hearing it right, I want to underline the importance of us continuing to work. Uh, communicate with our elected officials about the true costs. The current strategic plan does not have costs. It has numbers and goals, but it doesn't break out what the cost is to get to those goals. Mm -hmm. So I would really like us to continue to focus on that. I think that would be a more open discussion and it's a hard one, but I invite the hard questions about really it costs that much and we will answer those questions and we welcome the public debate, but I don't think people understand how expensive it is to stand up a program that's going to work. Many communities have stood up programs that were underfunded and tend to lead to huge constituent problems because the neighborhood then feels like it was a bad intervention to fund something well that's successful, that's integrated in the community costs a certain amount of money. And I think we have enough information to speak to that. So that that's my follow-up. I think we can do more of um, explaining the cost of these things. I, I'd love if you could do some of that right now. I mean, if you talk about adding 220 beds for you know at least 80 million or eight million dollars. I mean that's essentially forty thousand dollars a year. And I, I know um, a lot of members of the public sort of scratch their head and say, well how much is it, how does it cost that much just to provide a bed? And so first off, what are we what are we talking about providing? I mean is this a cot in a shared room or is this like a, a you know individual space or a room in a dormitory? Um, and then can you just speak a little bit to the, some of the services that go into that 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 make it cost so much? Yeah, um, numbers that we're using are between 80 and $120 a bed night, depending on the kinds of structure and services that are available. Um, the assumptions behind the numbers that we share with the board are that we're creating shelters that have opportunities for more privacy and that are low barrier. So you have to have adequate staff for folks who may have health issues or other challenges to be able to support them when they come into shelter um, and to be able to store their personal belongings uh, and potentially have partners. Uh, the other key part of that is having staff that aren't just there to help people stay in shelter, but are, they're actually helping people return to work, helping people get on a path to housing. Um, and I, I think it was the last board meeting we presented the relative cost of shelter versus uh, a permanent housing unit. And actually subsidizing permanent housing is cheaper than paying for a shelter bed because in a shelter, there's no rent being collected. We're often paying for the food and the extra services and, uh, to help people get on a path to housing. And there's costs associated with people living in community and, and maintaining the property and having the frequent turnover of spaces. Um, so uh, depending on the, the structures used and the location, the level of services and the target population, you kind of see a range of cost, but it, it is quite expensive. Um, our, COVID shelters, which were private hotel rooms, were much more expensive than that. They're um, three meals a day, services, private accommodations. Um, that was more in the $150 to $180 per night. Um, and I want to connect a dot 
um, with Robert's answer to your question with the previous discussion. And this is a recognition to our community-based organizations because to have an effective program, you need to have a, a community-based organization who can deliver the service at decent quality and the ability of a community-based organization to hire qualified staff that don't deal with what a lot of our nonprofits deal with back to the affordable housing is paying a community-based organization enough money to attract and pay for qualified staff, ideally locally, who aren't struggling and don't turn over because a big issue that is not nonprofit's fault, but nonprofit's challenge is having huge staff turnover. So I just, to invest in the actual cost of a high quality program, you have to pay for it. And most systems don't pay for the kind of shelters at the lower end of a lot of services. And therefore you have quality that matches the cost. So I just want to make that connection as well. You have to pay for good quality services. And I would say that building on that, our local data shows that the outcomes for different shelter and transitional housing programs in the county uh, are pretty strongly correlated to the amount of resources and staffing and staffing retention um, and the level of exit related services. So the programs that are making the most progress have resources to help people exit and to have them come into a stable environment. The lower resourced programs tend to have a lot more people returning to the streets within the first month or two because they don't feel safe or welcome and um, are not appreciating the program. And they have much lower out, um, performing outcomes in terms of helping people get income and benefits and exits to permanent housing. So it's a quantity versus quality dynamic. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do in our our messaging and our work is really promoting quality and resourcing programs well to get better outcomes. Great, thank you for the explanation. Um, you know, the, maybe one of the most troubling statistics that you shared was um, you know, not just the increase in chronic homelessness, but this 282% increase uh, in people with self-reported substance use disorder. I mean, that is just leaps off the page. Um, so an increase of 281 in 2019 to 1,073 in 2022. Um, do we have, I mean, you mentioned maybe some um, factors that might be playing into that, just, uh, you know, potentially good news that people are just more willing to admit that they have an issue. Uh, you know, Supervisor Coonerty talked about uh, the increase in meth. And of course, we've met use. And of course, we've seen that in terms of just um, cause of death in our community. I, is it is it an all of the above? Do you have any further description you can you can provide to why we're seeing this kind of an increase? Yeah, I think we're all generating hypotheses now at this point about what, what's really going on there, and uh, kind of adding to the list of things that have already been discussed. We we're still in the kind of tail end of a pandemic, and one of the things that I think people are um, underappreciating is during the pandemic, residential capacity across the board was reduced. So, residential substance use treatment capacity across the state has gone down. And I hesitate to call it residential capacity, but prisons and jails um, released people without options for where they were going to go. And a lot of people who are cycling in and out of our justice system have struggled with behavioral health conditions. Um, so I think there was a pandemic kind of, we need to keep the inside safe, not a lot of thinking about, okay, where are people going to go and what are the supports they're going to need to be successful. And uh, I also think that uh, across California, there's been not enough conversation about um, the challenges of substance use disorders. There's a lot of stigma associated with it. Even the um, managed care medical reform that I talked about, uh, substance use is not a top topic. And I, I think we as a, a state need to get beyond the, the moralizing around it. And uh, as a healthcare person, uh, it, um, substances can lead to ongoing permanent changes in people's neurochemistry and brain structure. And we need to treat those issues as health issues. And we need more resources at the state level and we need to be creative locally about how to expand options. I think the other thing I would say that the Santa Cruz Sentinel recently had an editorial about how horrible the housing first model is and that we need to address mental health and substance use issues first. And as someone who uh, worked in behavioral health for 14 years and saw what it was like to work with people who were sleeping in tents in large encampments and who would come into a 12-step program and then go back to the tent where the person who was using meth or dealing drugs was at, outside their door, um, <clears throat> you can't have recovery without a stable, safe place to live for almost most people. So the idea that you can treat and help people get on a path to recovery 
when they don't have a stable place to live. Um, and my experience and the experience of many other people who do the work, it, it just, it's not, it's not feasible. I mean, there's going to be the rare folks who can get into a treatment program and return back to an unsafe situation with a lot of triggers and maintain the recovery. But it's the pairing of a stable, safe place to live with the treatment that makes the difference. So I think we need more residential capacity, recovery residences, residential treatment. We also need more affordable places for people in recovery um, to sustain that uh, effort. And I also do think we need to continue to look at expanding the treatment. Um, the other thing about uh, the pandemic, and I think this is underappreciated, we've all been living through an incredibly stressful time. And folks who have a greater risk of experiencing a mental health or substance use issue as stress levels go up, the likelihood of actually experiencing mental health or substance use conditions goes up. So the, the rates of mental health problems have significantly gone up during the pandemic. And substance use is, is a part of that. Um, as people struggle psychologically and emotionally, um, they look for avenues to address that pain and suffering. So I think those are all factors. And um, the, the, the culture of a community and how accessible substances are is a well-known and established um, factor in terms of rates of substance use disorder. So I think we need to look at um, locally our culture around substance use and promoting prevention and recovery across all age groups to really get a handle on this. So multifactorial, probably more than you wanted to hear, Supervisor Kodak. Well, that's helpful. Uh, to, I think you named a few factors in there that we hadn't talked about before. Um, the report mentioned that permanent supportive housing capacity is underutilized because we need a higher level of service. So are we just sort of missing the, the healthcare staff, RNs, et cetera? Uh, but you, are you, when I hear that, I hear that the rooms are out there. Uh, so thank you for clarifying. The vouchers are there. Um, and so the challenge is for people with vouchers, uh, it's really challenging to be able to use a, a government subsidy in the private market without someone to help you navigate. So we have a lot of people with vouchers that don't have anyone helping them navigate that process. Um, and in a tight housing market, it's almost next to impossible to find a unit on your own if you're struggling out on the streets. So that's the, the biggest number one pairing is just what we call housing navigation. I think the other issue that the data is showing us is that there was a significant increase in the number of people who had been in affordable housing that had lost their housing. And I think this is a reflection of the aging trend and more health issues. And we've got to reorient our health services to help people stay in housing. So I think it is what you're talking about, field-based nursing and mental health care and um, in-home supportive services. Um, we have social workers who are helping folks um, move their beds and unpack their belongings because they physically can't, un they're moving stuff from storage, from being on the streets into their unit. Physically, they can't unpack on their own. Um, so we need to figure out how do we help people with those kinds of challenges to get the supports they need to stay in housing. Um, and I, I think as the population ages, this is going to be a, a bigger and bigger issue. More people living on fixed incomes who have health issues that need that kind of mobile health and human services support. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, last question for you. Um, you know, we've got this a little something to look forward to and that we've got this $4.6 million combined, uh, you know, of funding for, um, I, I believe it's for Permanent, so, permanent support housing, housing right? Yeah. So is that, again, this one-time money uh, that with, will there be any ongoing funds or I mean, is that just a matter of connecting people with vouchers uh, to, to pay ongoing costs? Um, yeah, can you sp speak a little bit more to, to what that? Yeah, I uh, like? appreciate that you picked up on it. It is one-time money and it has to be paired with that ongoing money for the services that we just talked about and for the, the cost of managing the housing. So for those dollars to be successful, we're going to have to find applicants who have vouchers or other ways of making the housing affordable over the long term that are tied to the building. And then a partnership with managed care, um, I anticipate to help make sure we're funding the services proactively on the front end for the folks when they move in. Um, so in the supportive housing world, people talk about the three legs of the stool. There's actual the building, then you need the money to operate the building, and then you need the money for the services. So what we're proposing is the money to help build the buildings, but we all have to pair it with those other resources to make those projects successful. 
Great. And do you anticipate when, when you anticipate releasing that RFP? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that we will bring back to the board in this next six months, perhaps before our two supervisors uh, retire, like the proposed RFP for um, you all to consider before we release it. And so depending on how that review goes, um, but my intention is that we'll we'll get something to you all in the next six months so we can get it out as quickly as possible. Okay, looking forward to that. Thank you. If there are no further comments or questions from board members, I'll open it to the public. Please approach the podium. Thank you. That's a lot of information and a lot of good, well-presented information. Thank you. I, um, I'm also distressed to hear the increase in homeless veterans. And I'm wondering if some of those have come from the CZU fire area. I know some that that is their case. Are these new people coming into the area because we have such a wonderful climate and um, a reputation for taking care of people? I, I want to ask Dr. Ratner, what is the possibility of doing an ibogaine pilot project here. That is a treatment that has been used with uh, success in other areas of the world to help uh, people um, eliminate, in effect, their addictions to hard drugs. It's been very effective from what I've read. I would like to see Santa Cruz be a pilot study area because the problem is so great. I want to ask the Board of Supervisors why 12 trailers that the county was given for COVID isolation for transitional use are now being used by the Parks Department for programs, if they are at all. It wasn't put back into housing. How can that be? <laughs> and, and I have that information from you, Chairman Koenig. 12 brand new trailers did not get used for housing continuing after COVID ended, or at least the, the money for it. Why are we not looking at county properties such as the, the property behind the uh, county medical facility in Watsonville at Freedom and Crestview? It sits empty. During the 1989 earthquake, that was a site that provided emergency housing for many, many FEMA trailers while people's homes were being rebuilt. Why aren't we doing something there? Uh, the new places need to be safe. All you have to do is spend some time looking out back in your backyard and see what goes on, and it is hair-raising. People are not safe there. People who pass by are not safe there. There's, there are drugs. They come in every Thursday at 4 p.m., I'm told, and things get crazy. There are gangs. There are women being drugged and sold in prostitution, and they're being stabbed and have bones broken. This is not a good place out here. We can do better. We declared our county housing crisis to get a, a large grant two or three years ago. Why not follow the model of Sonoma County and create pilot communities? and put people together in their communities, as you've said. They do have communities within these places. Comments uh, on Zoom or on the phone? Yes, Chair, we do. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, uh, Becky Steinbrenner always has valuable suggestions that I would like to see the board follow through on. I always ask the questions, why is something happening and who benefits? And we got a very disturbing report just now uh, with figures and how this is a multifactorial uh, problem. 
and Ryan Coonerty, I think you express well how what we're doing or what we're able to do is inadequate to address this huge problem. An article that gave me insight onto this, I'd like to, because we're not the only county. This is, and I gave you a copy of the article, Chair Koenig, because it was also written by a Peter Koenig. It's called The Implementation of the QR Code for Absolute Control by Peter Koenig. This is globalresearch.ca. Please, Karen, if you could keep your comments directed to the report. So here are the figures, some of what you were discussing here. According to Forbes, the economics analysis, there were 2,668 billionaires on April 5th of this year, 2022. That's about a 34% increase. In these states, you can clearly see that while the world population has become poorer, the wealth of the rich and especially the super rich has multiplied. Bill Gates' wealth, just one example, has increased from $96 billion in 2019. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Serge, your microphone is now available. Good morning, <clears throat> Chair Koenig and Board of Supervisors. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. My name is Serge Cagno. I'm the Executive Director of Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz. Thank you, Randy and Robert, for your work, your expertise, and your outside-the-box thinking to help our community with our homelessness crisis. Thank you also for the point-in-time count preliminary report. I've spoken before about Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz, which present, presently has 49 independent recovery cafes across the U.S. and Canada. Thank you, Supervisor Friend, who came and visited our program, Supervisor Caput, who I've spoken with about our program. In this discussion regarding homelessness, including the intersection of mental health and substance use issues, I would like to also add into the discussion that isolation and lack of community makes it more challenging for many to engage in services. Many people experiencing homelessness are not willing to receive shelter or shelter support services or consistency in engaging in the support services they're receiving. Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz believes everyone needs a community. I would like to invite the board and the Housing for Health staff to accompany me for a tour of Recovery Cafe San Jose to see what partnership with the city of San Jose using CBDG funding to create a beautiful environment to, prov to provide support services to increase service engagement, housing stability, and multiple outcomes of quality of life. I'll be sending an invite for a tour. If you're not available, I hope you're able to send a staff member in your place. I would also propose a pilot study showing the effect of the Recovery Cafe model in Santa Cruz on placing people in housing and maintaining housing for our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your and Housing for Health extensive work and creative problem solving with this public health issue. Be safe. Thank you, Mr. Cagno. Eric, your microphone is now available. Eric, can you hear us? It seems like the speaker's having a difficult time connecting. Um, this was the last speaker at this time. All right, thank you. Then I'll return it to the board for action. I'm happy to move the recommended action. I don't know if Supervisor McPherson wants to add any additional direction. Well, no, I'll, um, I'll hold off on that. I, I think um, let's get real about get the information, see, see what the state does. Uh, and then uh, if we can, I would like to get a special su a study session before the end of the year. Uh, well, the complete um, five member board of supervisors we have today is still here, but we'll wait and see on that. I'll second the motion, uh, just as presented. Okay, motion to adopt the recommended actions by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor McPherson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? 
Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. Sign and pass it unanimously. Thank you, directors Randy and uh, Randy Morris and Robert Ratner very much. Now proceed with item 10 to approve in concept an ordinance adding section 2.02.070 to the Santa Cruz County Code to implement term limits for members of the County Board of Supervisors. Schedule a special meeting on the Board of, of the Board of Supervisors for 4 p.m. on August 11th, 2022 to adopt a resolution calling for an election to adopt the term limit set forth in the draft ordinance as outlined in memorandum by Supervisor Caput. Supervisor Caput, please. You bet. Uh, thank you. I uh, won't make it into a long uh, presentation, but uh, I think most people are uh, familiar with uh, term limits and uh, they've been proven successful at both the federal and state level as a means and also county and city level to encourage political participation uh, by newcomers and uh, to diversify the representation of the voting public. Um, there, there is uh, incumbents tend to have an advantage in almost every election um, and uh, uh, name recognition is of course one and then uh, the other would be, uh, you know, political uh, fundraising. But uh, they, uh, term limits have been popular. Uh, some people say that uh, things aren't any better or they might be worse since we've had term limits. But if you think back uh, about 20 something years ago, uh, pensions were out of hand. And that was done before term limits came in. All the ones that were elected on uh, term limit uh, uh, laws were uh, the ones that have changed the pension uh, so it's sustainable. And uh, there's other there's other examples also. So anyway, uh, there's many uh, counties uh, and cities that have instigated uh, uh, term limits. And about 11 years ago, I brought up a proposal for eight years. Um, and if you notice, this has changed. It says uh, you cannot uh, run for a fourth consecutive uh, election. And uh, I changed that. So that, that allows 12 years. But it also allows, after four years, uh, the same one can come back and run again if they wanted to. Uh, it's a, it would be a four-year break, basically. So th those are two key changes. I, I do have a limit to my uh, hypocrisy because if, I'm, if it was passed 11 years ago, uh, we wouldn't be in an uh, uncomfortable position right now. I wouldn't be here if it was passed eight years ago, or 11 years ago, actually. And uh, this one doesn't affect uh, current, uh, in, a, in a certain way, it doesn't affect current supervisors because uh, let's say a supervisor right now has served two or three terms like myself. Uh, they would be able to run for three consecutive terms, if I'm correct, Jason. So uh, they could actually run for uh, 12 more years, take another break and come back and run for another four, uh, three consecutive terms. So anyway, uh, at, at, at the least, uh, this is calling for putting it before the voters. And I think uh, even if it was defeated, there would be a benefit in a healthy uh, public debate uh, that uh, voters could actually decide the whole issue. Uh, I don't see it as being really controversial. I think it's fair and I think it's very equitable. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I put it before you uh, for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Mr. 
Thank you, Super Chair. Supervisor Caput, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, um, I, I really don't have a preconceived thought on this of whether we should do it or not. I, I do not think we can have a special meeting in two days, August 11th on it. Um, I couldn't make it at 4 p.m. So that'd have to be someone, I, I'd be surely open for discussion. Uh, but as, um, as approved by the state legislature previously, um, there, there, it has to go to a vote to be approved by a majority of the voters. Um, and there have been some examples as a, the representative of the California State Association of Counties, there are 12 counties now that do have some form of uh, term limits. Um, the most popular being limited to three consecutive terms and, and those are in the counties of Los Angeles, San Mateo, Santa Clara and Ventura. Uh, three counties have two consecutive terms, that's El Dorado, Orange County, and San Francisco. Um, and then there's one uh, with no fewer than two terms. San Bernardino was trying to limit it to one term, but uh, they said, no, that's too stringent. Uh, two terms, two terms total is San Diego and San Joaquin, and um, two consecutive terms. Uh, oh, I just mentioned that, I think. But there's 12 counties of the 58 now that have some form of term limits, so it's not unusual. I'd be open for the discussion, but... Um, at a time late August or sometime in September would be uh, appropriate, I think. Supervisor Friend. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I mean, I, I appreciate um, this. Supervisor Cabot's been consistent about this. Um, actually, when he first ran, he said no more than two terms and, and here we are in the third term. So I appreciate the change, but, but I, I was trying to figure out uh, what problem we were trying to solve here. So I, I went ahead and looked at the history of the Board of Supervisors. You can uh, look up every supervisor the, the uh, library actually has, everybody's terms. And in the last 170 years, there have been a total of four supervisors that have actually served, uh, by my estimation, longer than these 12 years. So this isn't, this isn't an issue in our county is what I'm saying. In fact, two of them, it happened over 100 years ago. The last person to do it uh, was uh, Supervisor... Uh, Patton about 30 years ago. So I, I just don't know that this is really an issue. I mean, if this had been an on, ongoing, in fact, our chair is sort of evidence that it isn't an issue in regards to running against an incumbent that had served uh, three terms. So I, I just don't know that it makes sense to create this. I'll say as somebody who, um, I know that Supervisor Kapp had said that that, that there uh, is proof at the state and federal level that this works. That any, any public policy study seems to show the opposite of this. In fact, the term limits uh, do create some issues in regards to uh, not just institutional knowledge, but also increases special interest uh, funding and, and other issues. So I don't know that this is really necessary. If I'd seen when I'd gone back and looked at Santa Cruz County history of the Board of Supervisors that this had been an ongoing issue, I think that there would be some merit to this. But given the fact that the voters ultimately have a say every four years and whether or not they, they want us to end our term at that time, I think that it, it actually doesn't make sense. And I think that just looking at the history, as I was saying, Supervisor Caput, I mean, it, it, there, this isn't even a recent memory situation. We're talking four and 170 years that have served in our positions, two that were over 100 years ago that served longer than 12 years. I just don't see this as an ongoing issue. So I, I don't think I could be supportive of what's being presented because I just don't think it's it's really an issue. And I think the voters should ultimately make a determination for themselves as to whether or not they want any one of us to serve uh, longer than those 12 years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. Supervisor Friend uh, made every point I was going to make. Ultimately, um, it's up to the voters <laughs> and um, this, uh, you know, if, if this was a real issue, um, we would see evidence of it, but we haven't had uh, a supervisor here for more than 12 years in uh in 30 years. So uh, it's uh, it doesn't seem to be an issue right now. And ultimately, the voters, uh, I trust the voters to make this decision on who they want to have um, in office. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. If I could just ask a couple of process questions. The first was um, you know, around the proposal. So the Supervisor Caput's asking us to put this uh, on the November ballot, if I understand correctly, and, and that re requires a special meeting. It does require a special meeting because August 12th at 5 p.m. is the last time to put anything uh, on for uh, the November election. And and if this board ch chose to, it couldn't. We couldn't just choose to put this on the November ballot now. Uh, you 
arguably you could choose to put it on the November ballot now. However, staff has scheduled it so that you'll have the correct documents in front of you, the resolution calling for the election and combining it with the general election for a special meeting on Thursday. Okay, thank you. Um, and also just to point of clarification, um, Supervisor Cabot was saying it wouldn't apply to any of the current uh, board members, but um, you know, even if, it, you know, for example, myself, I would still be limited to three terms, even though I'm already seated. I mean, it's not. That, 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 that's correct. It, right. um, and I can explain further if there's any confusion around that. It's, it's, it's the, the ordinance is, is meant to apply prospectively according to state law. So it, it is in effect as of the date that it is adopted. Right. I think that's clear. Right. And uh, I, I do apologize in a sense for uh, uh, putting it up uh, late. Uh, it, you know, could have been brought up earlier. Uh, the problem was we were dealing with so much, uh, especially with COVID homelessness and uh, the uh, nonprofits uh, uh, dealing with that and approving a budget. And uh, actually, uh, I talked to Jason at that time, and it just seemed like we'd probably still be talking about it uh, after some of those meetings uh, that we did have. So uh, I, I don't know if uh, uh, does it, would it have to be uh, if we're proposing this for the next election in November that would require a special meeting, or can we say that we're approving it for an election two years from now? Basically, what you, your options, you could adopt it. You could adopt an ordinance like this at any time that you wanted to, and the ordinance will not become effective until the voters approve it. And so um, that is an option. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be a specific uh, election then. Your board could choose uh, to adopt this ordinance today and not hold a special meeting and, and uh, decide when and if at a later date. Okay. You wanted to call okay. an election for the voters to implement it. Yeah, I, I, I just think it would be healthy for uh, diversifying the uh, board and and, and uh, you know letting newcomers. Uh, uh, we I think we'd have more participation in the in the future. So I, I'm open to um, uh, amending it or going ahead with it and uh, saying we'll do it for November. Either one's fine with me. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I, I just had a couple comments. You know, certainly I appreciate you bringing this forward, Supervisor Caput. Um, you know, in in principle, um, clearly I, I agree. I ran on uh, the the phrase that twelve years was enough. Sure. Um, and I, I think that ultimately voters uh, are happy to tell us when they've uh, had enough of of any of us, and um, you know, have an opportunity, of course, to express their opinion during uh, those elections. Um. I, <laughs> I'm I'm sort of ambivalent about whether or not it actually be, needs to be add, added to statute um, in our county code. Uh, I, I do agree with the comments of Supervisor Friend. It doesn't really seem like it's a problem. Um, and, um, you know, we, anytime we are creating a, a, a law um, that doesn't have a defined problem, I think just I'm in principle uh, wary of that um, and in, in adding unnecessary code. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I don't feel strongly about the need for a, an actual ordinance because I think voters uh, ultimately, like I said, will tell, tell us when they've had enough of us. And, and three terms seems to be uh, pretty consistent there uh, in terms of the, the length of time any supervisor on average serves. Okay. Well, uh, this is oh. kind of like uh, Yogi Berra said, uh, deja vu all over again. So anyway, we'll okay. we'll see what happens here. Thank right. you, Supervisor Caput. I'll open it now for public comment. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Let me give you a different perspective from the other side of your dais. <laughs> I I have run for county supervisor twice, and it was very difficult. Supervisor Koenig, you know how hard it is when you have a well entrenched uh, incumbent. What, what helped you is that you had a lot of money behind you to even put on television ads. I had no money. I had to borrow money to pay the $1,200 filing fee to run. 
So there's a difference there. And as a member of the public and a former candidate, and I'm not a sore loser, I, I ran to give the people a choice on the ballot because they always need a choice. What I think is healthy is that there are term limits. And I support you putting this to the voters this November. Because it not only, maybe it hasn't been a problem in the 170 years of the county, but that doesn't say that it wouldn't be in the future. And what it gives the public assurance is that there is an intent that a candidate will come in by a clear vote, do the work they promised, be, be mindful, be transparent, be accountable to the public, and leave. That's why our constitution is set up that way. The president can only serve two terms because they recognize the responsibility to the public and that there needed to be a turnover regularly. That needs to happen in Santa Cruz County, whether it's, it's supported by an ordinance or not, but an ordinance makes the intent clear to the public. And I do think as a member of the public that it should be on the ballot this November. I'm sorry that it came at a last minute. Thank you, Mr. But Burke. I think it needs to happen. We have no speakers on Zoom at this time, Chair. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action. And Mr. Chair, I just think it's just, I don't normally respond to these comments, but you know, I think it's important to note, I mean, the constitution actually wasn't set up with presidential term limits. Um, <laughs> that was the 22nd amendment in the early fifties. And I think it's important if we're gonna at least uh, cite the constitution, we know what the constitution said at the beginning and all the way through, that's the point of the amendment process. We, you know, I think that our county has not had this issue historically. Um, and if it becomes an issue moving forward uh, every four years, uh, there's an opportunity, or as as Ms. Steinbrenner well knows, there's also an attempt to try and recall candidates if there's some sort of uh, issue that they have, which also can or can't be successful. There's a lot of there's a lot of of tools in the toolbox for people uh, in a democracy uh, to to be able to address their elected officials' performance, and this I think unnecessarily hamstrings future voters' ability to make a determination of who they want to serve. I mean, right now, what you're saying. Uh, right now, you would have a voter making a determination in November, potentially to create a term limit, that somebody who's six years old or seven years old won't be able to have their own say. Maybe there's at some point in the future when they have agency, they would actually want somebody to serve 16 years or 20 years. Maybe there's a value to it. I don't know. Um, but we take away and limit their options by doing this. This is a bright line. And, and so I think that this is actually a removal of options for, for the voters and not the other way. And, and I don't think that th that makes any sense. There hasn't been a historic issue in regards to this. And so I, I'm just going to, I'm not going to support, I know that uh, Supervisor Cabell will make the motion, but I'm not, I'm not going to support the motion for all those reasons. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if I might make a quick comment, uh, yes, it, it does allow for, it, it's basically a four year break. It would be three consecutive elections. You take a four year break, uh, that same uh, person could come back and run again for three more. So technically, a uh, supervisor could uh, serve uh, 24 years out of uh, uh, 28. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that it's basically, it's not saying you couldn't run again. And I do agree with you on uh, the, the shelf life of a supervisor tends to be about 12 years. Uh, I don't know. I could the the exception, of course, was uh, Gary Patton more more recently. And if you go back farther in history, there were a number of them that served for more than sixteen or twenty years consecutively. But uh, yeah, more recently, it would be the uh, Gary Patton, and the, and he was a fine supervisor. I have no problem with that. Thank you. All right. Well, then. Um... Is there a motion? Okay, I'll, I'll move to uh, 
uh, consider uh, putting it on the ballot either for November or approving it for a future election. Uh, uh, either either one, uh, if if there's a second. Thank you. I'll second for the sake of discussion. Okay. Thank you. All right. Is, is there any further discussion? Yeah, too, uh, too fast, too soon. Uh, I'm going to vote no. Okay. Thanks for roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? No. Coonerty? No. Caput? Aye. McPherson? And Koenig? No. This item did not pass. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our uh, regular agenda for the day. Uh, well, the board will now move into closed session. Uh, Council, is there any items that uh, will be reportable out of closed session? No reportable items today. All right. Thank you very much. Um, then that brings the public portion of our meeting to a close. The board's next regular meeting will be August 23rd, Tuesday at 9 a.m. Thank you.